Hello, I'm Helen King from the Open University. In the last video, I talked about representing the body through dissection and about the difficulties of showing something in two dimensions that's actually happening in three. In this video, I want to think about something rather different. It's the idea that we can understand our bodies by thinking of little things happening inside, little things living inside us, invading us or coming in to help us. So let's go back to something I talked about in that very first video in the series. I showed an image from the 1940s, a wonderful poster from the Ministry of Health, with a man trying to trap some very lively germs in his handkerchief. As early as the 1900s, though, it had been argued that not all germs were necessarily a bad thing. In this Punch cartoon from 1905, we see some friendly germs. The doctor visits his patient, accompanied by a host of benevolent microbes. He'll offer them as cheerful and congenial companions to the sufferer. We can see here gout, with its feet and legs bandaged, hay fever, blowing his nose, tennis elbow, wearing a sling on one arm. Phlebitis, flu and mumps fly in over the whole assembly. The cartoonist here was Arthur Rackham, probably better known to you as the Arthur Rackham who illustrated Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales and Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens, but just one year after this cartoon. More little creatures, this time fairies. The caption for the Punch cartoon included a reference to the doctor Frederick Treves, Sir Frederick Treves. He's the man who successfully operated on King Edward VII in 1902 for peritophilitis, inflammation of the area around the cecum and the appendix. In 1905, the year of the cartoon, Treves published an article in the British Medical Journal entitled A Conception of Disease, and I'll just read you a few moments from it. He described as the prevailing idea of disease a something that is woeful and malignant, evil in origin, evil in intent, evil in effect. Disease, he said, strikes us down, it consumes us, it seizes us. The language of war was common. Leukocytes, white blood cells, he said, have a passion for fighting. They meet the invaders in the open. The area around the wound, he said, is a battlefield. The lymphatic glands make a stand at the second circle of entrenchments. But he argued something like inflammation after an injury is good, not bad. It makes us rest the affected part while what he called the invading force is met with the defenses of the body. In this poster from around 1910, a few years after Treves's article, advertising the disinfectant Anios, a range of nasty looking diseases are kept away by using it. They're kept away and kept out of the country. The invasion can't happen. The battlefield imagery of disease has remained very popular. For example, the war on cancer, a metaphor first used by President Nixon in the early 1970s when he signed the National Cancer Act. This was at the same time as the Vietnam War was being fought, so war on all fronts. In 1978, Susan Sontag, in Illness as Metaphor, challenged this view of cancer as what she called an evil, invincible predator invading the body. It's an image which isn't always helpful to those who actually have the disease. The imagery of battles against little things invading our body is only part of the story. People have used similar imagery to think about normal processes happening inside the body. In the long history of thinking about what's happening inside us, one very powerful image is that of the house. It can be found as far back as the Roman orator Cicero in the first century BC. Romans were very good at drains and this plan shows the cloaca maxima as the red line. This particular drain was actually more about controlling the water on the streets when the Tiber River flooded. The sewer system though linked to many public buildings. Private houses, however, weren't linked into the system. They would have a cesspit, often quite near the kitchen, not linked to the main sewer lines at all. 
In his book On the Nature of the Gods, Cicero talked about the body as a house. He wrote, and just as architects relegate the drains of houses to the rear, away from the eyes and nose of the masters, since otherwise they would inevitably be somewhat offensive, so nature has banished the corresponding organs of the body far away from the neighbourhood of the senses. So that's why you have your nose and your eyes at the top of your body and your bottom at the bottom. Turning now to an image from a Hebrew encyclopedia of the early 18th century, we can see here Tobias Cohen has shown the whole body alongside a house with four stories. The stomach is a cauldron in the house's kitchen, and the heart is one floor up, behind a lattice window which represents the lungs. The windows at the top are the eyes. This wasn't just an 18th century way of thinking about the body. In the early 19th century, after publishing a series of articles in periodicals aimed at young people, the reformer and vegetarian campaigner, William Alcott, published a popular guide to anatomy called The House I Live In, or The Human Body. It was aimed at families and schools and went into many editions. The introduction described the body as a curious building, one of the most curious in the world. Not that it's the largest, or the oldest, or the most beautiful, or the most costly, but because of what he called the skill and wisdom of the great master workman who planned it. The body, which is the house, has two stories and a dome with 15 or 20 rooms. The pillars are the leg bones, the girders are the ribs. The dome is the skull, and the eyes are the only windows of the house. Domestic architecture is one way of thinking about the body and its inner workings, but another very powerful image is that of the factory. After the Industrial Revolution, from the 1840s onwards, this had an impact on medicine. A new enthusiasm for keeping the bowels regular went along with improvements in public health, and the body was seen as a factory needing to have a really good waste disposal system to keep sinister gases from being produced because those would have a bad effect on the body. So constipation was a very, very dangerous illness in this model. In the 1920s, Fritz Kahn produced some very powerful visual metaphors of the body. His 1927 Man as an Industrial Palace was animated in 2010 by the designer Henning Lederer. We see the various areas of the brain here. The eye is a camera. Then there's various control centers in the brain. And also the processes of digestion and breathing as factory assembly lines. Inside the body, there are lots of little men working hard to keep up the production process, as well as refineries and combustion engines. And the figures inside don't have to be men. In 19th century Japan, an image of a beautifully dressed courtesan was shown with little humans inside her, hard at work. This image was intended to educate the general public, to let them know about the five viscera, the six entrails, but also to warn against too much sex or booze. There are women shown in the spleen and in the liver, doing some cooking. In the modern West, some of us may be familiar with the Numbskulls, a comic strip from the Beezer, which began in 1962. It features a series of characters living inside a man's head. The hero, our man, is woken up after Luggy from the ear departments, hears the alarm clock and sends a message to Brainy, who wakes up the other Numbskulls, and then communicates with our man through the suggestion box, where he suggests switching the alarm off. Our man, in later versions of this cartoon strip known as Ed Case or Head Case, thinks he's in control. The joke is that he's not. He's controlled by the little people inside him. And finally, those little creatures in your body could be doing more than controlling how your body works. They could be keeping it healthy. There's a series of images called Toothville, created by the dentist and photographer Ian Davis which represents aspects of dental care by showing various little people defending or cleaning the teeth, as in this image of a sugar attack. 
Davis's theme is that small, small things can make a big difference. It's amazing what you find if you travel inside the body.